Glad you're joining us online from wherever you're joining us. Type it in the chats if it's in-state, out-of-state, in the city, out of the city. We're glad that you're here as well. Hey, before we jump into James and catch you up on where we're going today, I wanted to kind of uh, give you a, an announcement before the service. I'm so excited, you guys. We are celebrating our eight-year anniversary on Sunday, <laughs> September 12th, you guys. Eight years old, man, and look what God has done in eight years I am amazed every time that, that uh, I come onto this campus, every Sunday, that, uh, that look, at, I mean, eight years, I could, and I know that the, the best is yet to come. How many say amen? amen. The best is yet to come. So on, on our eight-year anniversary, it is always a unique day for us here at Discovery to celebrate all that God has done, but it's also a vision day for us that we look forward to what's ahead of us. So I'm going to be sharing some vision things, really excited to share some things about our next steps as a church, where we're going, what God is doing, but I also wanted to show you some updated like service times. It's real small in the bottom here so y'all can't see it. It's 8 a.m., 9.45, 11.30, and 6.30. We're actually going to be going to four services on our anniversary Sunday, eight-year anniversary. And the reason is we need to make some room for what God is doing. I believe we're living in a day of harvest. Amen, you guys? Like there is an amazing harvest that God is outpouring. And we just got to, and we're going to be opening up our kids' building. We're putting in theater seats back here in the back. It's just, we're doing some amazing things in our city. And I think God's just going to continue to bring more and more people. So we need to make some room. So this service right here that starts at nine, you actually have a choice to make. You either, you either come real early or 45 minutes later. And I did that on purpose. I shifted your time on purpose because I, I'm shifting everyone's time because I, I want everybody to have to make a choice because the, the most popular service time is going to be probably 11.30. 9.45 is going to rival it though. It's going to be right there at 9.45. So here's what I want to ask the faithful Jesus lovers who, who are just so humble and sacrificial and just those of you who really, really love God, those of you who really love God, I'm going to ask you to come on early with me and worship at 8 a.m. Come on, somebody. All right. I see you. I see you. Okay. Mental picture. Let's see if you're out here. I'm going to see if you're out here at 8 a.m. All right. But, but here's, we just need to make some room for what God's doing. We need to open up some seats for the, for the people that God is bringing. Excited about that. Let's jump into our message today. Man, we're in part seven of James. This series, we're reading the whole book. We probably read more of the Bible than you've read your entire life by yourself. I'm helping you out here. I'm reading more scriptures than I hope that's not true. But for some of you, I know it's a reality. But uh, James has been in this section of James since uh, probably around James chapter 2, and uh, middle of 2 into James chapter 3. James has been talking to us in this final part of the book. He's been talking to us about real faith and what real faith is. And everything's kind of connected to that now. James is just kind of connecting all these scriptures have to do with an authentic faith. What does that look like? What is real, dynamic, authentic faith look like. And so a couple weeks ago, he kind of, we, we studied real dynamic faith that it actually bears fruit and changes our life. That which is real. It's not just a knowledge thing. It's a transformation thing that God does something, a great work from the inside out in our life. And it's not even something that we force ourselves or that we're trying to like, like try to be good. No, God actually changes you into a brand new person and he'll blow your mind. He will blow your mind. If you let God, he'll do it. Then the next topic we jumped into was our tongues. And James said, hey, you can recognize real faith by how you manage your mouth. And, and because out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. So, so he said, hey, we need to, we need to manage our tongues. And, and so we studied that, how to manage our mouths and manage our tongues. And then last week he said, hey, you can recognize real faith by the wisdom you're operating by. There is a wisdom that is of this world. It sounds right and it sounds good, but it's very earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. Like it's producing results that are stealing, killing, and destroying in our life. And contrastly, there is a wisdom of heaven that God gives generously to all without finding fault. Today, today, and the reason why I catch you up, I just wanna, I want you to see where we're going now in James chapter four, beginning today. James is gonna tell us another aspect of real faith that you can see real faith by how you fight and who you fight. 
You can recognize real faith in a believer. Now remember, this is a letter he's writing to Christians who are scattered all over the place. He's saying you can recognize real faith in your life and someone's life by how you fight and who you fight. That's what we're going to talk about today, James chapter 4. But before I even read the scriptures, can I, I want to ask you to do something. And it's so important, you guys. I want you to get, like, your idea of you're doing what is right out of your mind. Like, it doesn't matter that you're right. It does not matter. So when you think about your fights and the arguments that you're having, it does not matter if you are right. And I want you to just surrender your rightness to God right now, because listen, this is why it's so important. Too many of you are justifying how you fight and who you fight because you think you're right. Oh, that was good. That was good. Okay. Listen, listen. Too many of you, listen, you're justifying how and who you fight because you think you're right. But right now, what I want you to do is forget about your idea of rightness. Forget about what you think is right. And maybe, look, I'll even concede, maybe you are right. I'm not saying you are. I'm not saying you're not. What I'm saying is that you need to surrender that rightness because it doesn't matter if you're doing the right things but becoming the wrong person because God is more interested in who you're becoming than what you're doing. So you could be doing all the right things but becoming the wrong person and you will have missed the entire point. So, so it does not matter. James is going to... James is going to challenge us today like he has every week. And there are going to be some ouches today. Some ouches today. But it probably, I'm telling you, it's probably not even going to be from me. It's going to be from your wife next to you going, uh, uh. Or, or the person next to you going, see, see. So let me, it's always good just to remind us, hey, this message is for you. This message is for you. It's not about them. It's not about him, her, them, all those people you're thinking about. It's for, it's for you. Okay. So get your idea of right like, it doesn't matter. I'll even concede. Maybe you are, but will you just forget about that for the next 30 minutes? Because actually, James does not even bring that into the equation at all. It, it, it takes no, he doesn't take it into consideration with how you fight and who you fight. You being right does not matter how you fight and who you fight. Are you with me, church? Okay, so we're going to surrender that. James chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. We're going to study that today. Let me start off with the first few verses, and then we're just going to, we're going to study this. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? So this is where it starts off. What is, like, what, what's, what's causing it, and how do you stop it? What's causing all these fights and quarrels? And this is where you go, it's easy. She is. <laughs> it's easy. Sleeping next to the dude, man. It's, if he would just get saved, pastor, and come to church and I'll pray for me, all that stuff. Now, again, you might be right, but that don't matter. That does not matter how you're handling this thing. So he says, what's causing the quarrels and the fights? And we're going to come back to that, quarrels and fights. Why did he use both those words? We're going to study those words. Don't they actually come from the evil desires at war within you? It really isn't even coming from outside of you. Again, this kind of, back to James chapter one when he was saying, hey, where does temptation come from? It wasn't from God, it's from inside of you. Hey, what is God trying to do in trials? It's, he's actually trying to do something inside of you. He's just pointing it back like it's actually you. So here's, here's where it's coming from. He says, you want what you don't have, so you scheme and you kill to get it. You're like, well, I haven't killed anybody, but with your words, have you killed? Have you destroyed somebody's reputation? their character? Have you, have you pulled them down or have you stabbed them with the dagger of a harsh word, with a sarcastic comment? You scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. I thought that was interesting. Like, you can't get You don't have it and you can't get it. I'm gonna come back to that. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them. And this, so this isn't just like normal kind of fighting, bickering here, little, little, little tiss of arguments. He's, he's talking about a war between people. And I'm so glad that you're here. I believe you're here on purpose. God has a word for, for you today on how to stop fighting. How to stop fighting. There's two words he used, quarrel and fight. Let me show them to you in the Greek. A quarrel is polymas in Greek. And what that means is, it's like a war term. It's long-term hostility or a long-standing argument. Here's what I want you to do. Just, we, 
Will you think about right now, who are you in a quarrel with? You don't need to say that a lot of me, but maybe just write it right there in that note. Like, is there, is there a long standing hostile, hostile relationship that you, you currently still, you still have that today? Is there a long standing argument, a quarrel that you're in today? Or maybe a fight, a fight. Now, what's the difference with a fight? A quarrel is like a, is, is the, the war. The fight is kind of like the skirmishes. It's, it's uh, you, you pronounce this and I wrote it down. Machi, that's hard. Machi is what it is, the Greek word. Short, those are short-term battles and disputes. So once you think about that, what are, what are throughout your day and your week and your job and your home life, what is, what is, who are you fighting with? Who are you fighting with? Who, who are you in little short-term battles with? Short-term arguments, just little disputes. And I want you to think about those quarrels and those fights because James has and God has actually a lot to say about how you're quarreling, how you're fighting, who you're fighting, why you're fighting. So what does he say? What does he say? He says, what causes fights? What causes the fights? And this is gonna be challenging for a lot of us because it's not what you think it is. It's actually the conflicting desires within me. That's what James says. What causes fights and quarrels among you? It's actually the conflicting desires. And what are those conflicting desires? Let me just summarize it. You want things you don't have or you want things others have. That's where all of your quarrels and your fighting is coming from. Every kind of long-standing hostility that you have. Again, I know what you're doing right now. I sense it. You're saying, but I'm right. But they're wrong, pastor. But they're wrong. No, no, no. Get rid of that. You're conditioned to justify yourself with how you fight and who you fight based on how you think you're right. Get that out of your mind. You being right has no bearing in this issue at all. So get it, get, come against that. Just cast that out, okay? That's not what God wants you to be thinking about of who's right or who's wrong. He wants you to think about what's going on inside of your heart. Okay, we're quarreling and fighting because there are things I don't have or I want what others have. Basically he says, we're want, we want, I want. I want it, we're wanters. We are our wanters, we're a bunch of wanters. You know that? We want, we want, want, want. That's where all of our fights are coming from. Let me, let me kind of, James gives us a few like areas of want, and I'm just gonna kind of dig into this a little bit more and give you about five, five areas of want or conflicting desires within you that are causing your fights. Like your fights are caused by probably one of these five things. Write these down. The first one is the conflicting desire is priority. Like I want, I want to be first, <laughs> I want, I want it first, I wanna be first, I want preference, I want, so I wanna be at the front of the line, so I'll cut you off, I need to cut you off, I'll speed up, I'll do whatever, like I just, I just want priority, I want what I, I want what I want, I want the priority, my needs, my wants, my interests, they actually take priority above yours and everybody else's, and I'm gonna fight for it. Usually it's because I'm right, because I'm right, and that's why, that's why. Okay, but Philippians chapter two, verse three and four says this. Be humble, thinking of others as what? Better than yourselves. Like, and I'm not saying to think of, you don't need to think of yourself less to think of somebody better. Did you catch that, you guys? You don't need to think of yourself less to think somebody is better, okay? You don't need to base yourself and, and think bad things about yourself. No, no, no. He, what he's saying here is like, just lift people up in your minds. Don't pull them down. Just lift them up. Think, think better than yourself. Don't look out only for your own interests. Oh my goodness. But take an interest in others too. You know how many of our fights could be handled right here? If we just took this verse seriously and we thought better of others than we do of ourselves, if we actually lifted them instead of lowered them, if we, if we consider their interests, their preference, their priority over my, so their interests over my interests, their needs over my needs. Like how many, there would be no fighting in your marriage. There'd be no fighting in your house. There'd be no fighting anywhere if we actually thought everyone better and put their needs and interests before our needs and interests. So the first thing we want, the conflicting desire is priority. Here's the second thing. And James actually talks about possessions. 
Do people fight about possessions still today? Yeah, not just your kids, right? You do too, right? People sue each other, take people to court, drag them into court, sue them over things that they want or they believe that they deserve. They fight over it. Now listen, it's okay to have possessions. God does not care. He doesn't mind you have possessions. He just does not want your possessions to have you. So James chapter four, verse two, he says, you want what you don't have. Like I want, you want more, more things. Now God created things to be used and people to be loved. So we, God created, look, you're to love people and use things. But most people get in trouble when we get that backwards. That we, that we start, if we start loving possessions, you'll start using people. Okay, this is where some of your conflicting desires, something you want more. How many arguments can you probably chalk up to this, that, that you wanted something you did not have? And you fought for it. You fought for that thing. You wanted that thing. And, and, and you started treating that thing or the desire for that thing better than the person. You started loving things and using people. Possessions is another area that, that will cause conflict, quarrels, fights. Here's number three. The third conflicting desire is our pleasures. The pursuit. We are a pleasure-dominated society now. Everything is, is marketing to your pleasures and your desires. And honestly, all that, now in our, all that matters is how you feel. How you feel is all that matters. We are a pleasure dominated society. In verse three, James says, you only want what actually gives you pleasure. It doesn't matter what it does for anyone else. It doesn't matter what God thinks, as long as you're happy with it, as long as it gives you joy, now you can enjoy life. You know, God does, God actually, I believe, wants you to enjoy life. God wants you to have true joy in life and abundance. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it to the full, or one translation says, an abundant life. God does not mind you enjoying life, but when you make pleasure your main goal or why of life, you'll never, you'll never get there. You'll never get there. If you make it your goal, it will become your God. If you make pleasure your goal, it will become your God, and then you'll fight, you'll quarrel over what gives you pleasure. Here's the fourth conflicting desire, and that's people, people. Now, this is where a lot of you go, oh, thank you, put it on the list, because I know that's my number one right there, Pastor. That's where all of it comes from. No, 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 that's not, that's not what I'm saying here, okay? It's not the people, listen, it's your desire for people. It's not, it's not the people, listen, it's your desire either to control the people or to be liked by the people. It is your desire to either control them or be controlled by them that is causing conflict. Because when you can't control them, that's where the quarrel comes from. That's when you start fighting. Or when they don't like you anymore, that's when you get defensive and insecure and start going off the handle. Because, oh my gosh, what do they think of me now? No, no, I need to defend that because I need to be liked. It's your action, it's the people, aren't, it's, your, it's your desire for people. It's a misplaced affection, a misplaced desire for people. John chapter 12, Jesus said that there's some people actually, they love human praise more than the praise of God. That we care more about what people are thinking and doing than what God is about what people are thinking and doing. People. Here's the last one. Position and power. Oh, we want what others have or what we don't have. I, he said, you want what you don't have and you can't get it. Okay, meaning like there are some things that just, it's either, he didn't say like, why can't you get it? But maybe it's, out, it's not God's timing. It's not God's will for you. It's, uh, it's just not, that God does not have that for, for you. And, and what I found is that when immature people can't get something, they'll criticize others who have it. They'll criticize others, they'll chop them down. So I can't go higher, so I'll pull you lower. I can't get better, so I'll make you look worse. But know this, people who throw dirt always lose ground. Galatians chapter five, verse 26. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. That word conceited, 
It means empty glory. In fact, some of your translations probably say, let us not have empty or pursue empty glory. It means this, that when someone has something that God didn't give them, it's conceited. It's empty glory. When you, when you, when you try to get something that God says, it's not your time, it's not your place, you get, that's not yours, and you try to go after it anyway, the Bible says that's empty glory and you're conceited. Come on, I love you and I'm your pastor. You remember that, you guys, okay? All right. What causes quarreling and fights? He says, it's your conflicting desires within us. Then he explains uh, all the way through verse 10, James chapter four, on how to actually stop fighting. So if you're here today and like, and you, you fight, you find yourself fighting with maybe coworkers or bosses or in your different relationships, you find it, or maybe it's not even like, like outwardly, but inwardly there's turmoil and war or quarreling, whether it's longstanding things, hostility it arguments, and it's changed and redefined the relationships and you're still heard about it, or you got little disputes all the time, maybe even with the same people, this message is for you. James is talking to you today. He says, real faith is shown in how you fight and who you fight. So if you, act, if you wanna stop the quarreling, in the fighting, James is going to help us out today with six things, okay? Write it down. Number one, he wants us to realize how destructive fighting is. It's destructive. Now, there is, there is a healthy form of conflict, and James isn't talking about that here. He's, he's talking about the toxic form of quarreling and fighting. He calls it waging war. See, in a healthy argument, people attack the problem. But in a fight, people attack each other. Big difference, man. In this form of toxic quarreling and fighting, attacking each other, that is poisonous in any relationship. Now, I didn't realize how much fighting and quarreling there is in the Bible and how much about fighting and quarreling there is in the Bible. God has a lot to say. There's actually 75 different teachings that I found in studying this talk about quarreling and fighting. 75 different teachings throughout the Bible about quarreling and fighting. This is a big deal to God. The, the, the families in the Bible are no different than families today. They had a lot of quarreling and fighting. Let me give you a few of them, you guys. The first two brothers, Cain and Abel, had a fight, resulted in a murder. Abraham and Sarah, they had a husband and wife quarrel. Jacob and Esau, Joseph and his brothers, they had sibling rivalries. Lot and Uncle Abraham, they had a quarrel. I don't have time to go through all the verses today, but I want to give you just a taste of how, much God, how important this is to God about quarreling and fighting. At least six times we are commanded to never, at least six times we're commanded by God to never quarrel and fight. Ephesians chapter four, verse 31 says, quarreling, harsh words, and dislike for others. <laughs> Some of you ought to circle, underline. <laughs> You're justifying your dislike and stuff. Dislike of others should have no place in your life. It should have no place. God says quarreling is a mark of immaturity. That if you are quarreling and fighting, if you have long-standing rivalries and disputes all the time, then you are not as mature as you think you are. First Corinthians chapter 3 says you are still only baby Christians, controlled by your own desires, not God's. When you are jealous and divide into quarreling groups, he says, doesn't that prove you're still babies? Wanting your own way? In fact, you're acting like people who don't even belong to the Lord at all. Quarreling, he says, is a mark of your spiritual immaturity. Proverbs 16, 28, he says, a devious person or a troublesome person is someone who spreads quarrels and a gossip separates close friends. God says, if you serve the Lord, like if you're, if you're a servant of God, if you're a Christian, that, that if you're serving God like I wanna serve God, I'm commanded not to quarrel and fight if you wanna be a servant of God. 2 Timothy chapter two says, a servant of the Lord, that's who we are, servants of God, must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach and patient with the people you're justifying the way that you're fighting. Difficult people, like you gotta be patient with difficult people. That's a characteristic of being a servant of God. And as a pastor, Check this out. The scriptures instruct me, like command me to tell you to not quarrel against your government officials, like to not fight over politics. 
no matter who's in office. Like, I'm commanded to teach that to you. Y'all, oh, where's that in the Bible? Let me show it to you. Titus chapter... The, so I know, come on, some of you don't want to hear this, but this is like, this is like very relevant for our culture and our day and age because we justify what side we're on and uh, we think we're right so we can say what we want to say or fight how we want to fight. And that's just, you being right has nothing to do with it. It has nothing at all to do with it. Titus chapter three, Paul writing this to, to a, a pastor. He, Paul wrote three letters to pastors, okay? So this is like a letter I need to take serious. He says, as a pastor, you're to remind the believers to submit to the government and its officers. They should be obedient, always ready to do what is good. And look what he says, they must not slander anyone and must avoid quarreling. Instead, they should be gentle and show true hum humility to everyone. No matter who is in office, you are not to speak evil of or quarrel against that person. If you are, look, if you want to, if you're a servant of God. Now, I'm just, I'm giving you the standard of a servant of God, of those who, who, who want to let their life be led by the scriptures. And I know this is, you wish you, that wasn't in there. You wish that verse wasn't in there. I know. But it is. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. I just want to give you a taste today. Just a taste. There's so much in the Bible. Okay, these aren't even in your notes. Keep reminding God's people. Again, as a pastor, he's telling me to do it. Keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. But they said, and they were wrong when they said, don't you, they, 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 they that, no, 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 no. It doesn't matter if they're wrong. It doesn't matter. What matters is you. What matters is your heart. How you're fighting and who you're fighting does not change if you're right. It is of no value and only ruins those who listens. Proverbs 17, 14. Last one I'll give you. Last one about quarreling, then we're gonna, we're gonna continue. Because you gotta just, you gotta recognize how destructive fighting and quarreling is this is something that should not be in the heart of a servant of God. It doesn't matter, again, if you're right. The, the Bible says, like, like, it's so destructive. Here's what the Proverbs says. Starting to quarrel is like breaching a dam. So drop the matter before that dam breaks and floods the entire, val fam the entire valley. Meaning, like, it's, it's going to seep its way into the other areas of your life, into the other areas of your heart, into the other areas of your relationships, like, it's not worth it. Stop the matter. You got to realize, you guys, how destructive fighting is. Number two, if you want to stop the fights, number two, stop expecting out of people what only God can give you. Stop expecting. This is one of the greatest causes of conflict in our relationships, especially marriage, because, because I got married because they complete me. You know what I mean? What a bunch of baloney. You know what I mean? That person cannot, no way, no how, complete your self-esteem, complete your emotional lack. In no way can that person, that's just unrealistic, it's unfair, and it's only setting yourself up for massive frustration. Your spouse is not God. Your best friend is not God. Your coworker is not God. Like, like none of the, like. None of those people can provide what God can provide. None of them can do for you what only God can do for you. They're broken human beings just like you, okay? So stop expecting from people what only can come. It's, it's time to change your expectations so your frustration doesn't lead to your conflict and quarreling in your relationships. James says a lot of our conflicts and quarreling is because we're going to the wrong source and, and when we... And, and when we do go to God, we're actually going for the wrong reasons. James chapter four continues, verse two. He says, you do not have because you do not ask God. You're expecting other people to fulfill that in you or give that to you. So listen, you'd rather fight for it than pray for it. You'd rather, you'd rather fight for that thing and maintain control because you think you can, you can get it better than pray for that. And I'm telling you, you're robbing God of glory in your life because if you fight for it and you actually manipulate and coerce and roll up on somebody and get what you want, what is that? Do? Like you're getting your own result. If you pray for it, you'll get God's results. Look, stop, stop quarreling and start praying. Stop your fighting for it. And start praying for it. But listen, God is not your genie. Can I just, he's not your, your magic like wishing machine, okay? 
That's why, that's why he says, when you ask, you don't receive because you think, you think he's your slot machine or something. You're asking with the wrong motives. God is not, God is not going to make you a millionaire. Some of you just need to receive that right now. Okay, that is a prophetic word. Some of you are rejecting that, like, I cancel that. Listen, that is not God's goal and dream for your life. If it's a byproduct of your purpose, that's another thing. That is not God's goal for your life. God's goal is not comfort in your life, but character. Comfort's in the next life. Some of you are wanting your, God didn't promise you comfort. Like you're going to get comfort there. Man, that is when there's no sorrow and tear and all that stuff. Like that's what you get over there. But right here, God does, could care less about your comfort. He's trying to develop your character. So, so that's what God is doing. He's trying to work inside of you. God does not exist to serve us. We exist to serve him. So let's not get that backwards. Let's not ask. He's saying, hey, the reason why you're, like, you're not getting it is because you're asking with the wrong motives. You're acting like God is here to meet your needs. And it's the, actually the other way around. You need to submit to yourself. When I, when I look to other things and people to meet my needs, God says it's a, it's a form of spiritual adultery. I cheated this one in last week, but I'm going to give it to you. Last week I gave you this verse. James chapter 4 continues. He says, look, when you're looking to other people and other things to meet your needs, when God was supposed to be the one that God gets really jealous and he considers that a form of adultery that you're cheating on him with something else, with the world. He says, you adulterous people, don't you know that your friendship with the world means you're separating yourself? I told you last week, if you guys missed that message, that adultery, just like in a marriage, that you're married, but you got a little something going on on the side, that's what God considers when you're looking to someone or something else to meet your expectations other than God. God is, you're acting like you love God, but you got a little bit else, something going on the side. You want something else to meet your expectation. And he goes, therefore, Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or don't you think that the scripture says without reason that he, is, he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell within us? God is a jealous God. He wants to be the one you go to to meet your needs, to provide for your needs, to meet your expectations. Number three, how to stop, how to stop the fights. The third thing Jason tells us is we need to choose humility over prideful anger. Humility is the key because pride is the culprit. Of all your fightings, look at this, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10, it says, pride is actually what is leading to the conflict. That's what led you there. Anytime you find yourself in a conflict, what led you there is pride. You didn't feel like you were treated the way you deserved. You didn't get what you expected, when you expected it, from who you expected it, you didn't get what you, and now you're frustrated and fr your frustration leads to fighting. Have you ever been in an argument with someone and it got to a point where you knew you were wrong and, and you didn't want to admit it? Okay, James continues, verse six. He says, as the scripture says, God is, and he uses the word against. He, what it means, this word against means stands in opposition. Some of your translations are actually opposition. That's what I mean. God is, listen, God is standing in opposition against your pride. But he gives grace to the humble. So give yourselves completely to God, he says. God is against, listen, God declares war against pride and ego. So anytime pride rears its head up in my life, listen to me, anytime that happens, you have just moved on the opposite end of God. Anytime you're acting in pride, you are opposing, standing in, in a boxing match with God. And you're gonna lose that fight every time. You cannot win that match, I promise you. Every time. Uh, I know you thought that you were being stubborn toward that person or that situation, but your posture actually pushed out God. Your posture puts you on an, op an opposing end of God's will for your life. Now look, God wants to give you grace for your, humili for your humility. You know what grace is? Grace is the power to change. What you can't change yourself, God can change through his grace. 
What you can't change in your marriage, God can change through his grace. What you can't change in your life, God can change through grace. What you can't change in your mind, in your temper, in your attitude, God can change. What you need is the power of God's grace. But the only way you get God's grace, there's only one way, humility. That's the only way that you can get God's grace. So he says, give yourself completely to God. The key is completely. So hey, give that area. Give that argument. Give that relationship. Give that to God. Completely surrender that struggle. And then here's the promise in verse 10. James says, humble yourselves before the Lord. Stop, stop. Because you think you're right, you think you can stand up and assert your rightness. No, no, no. That's not where you belong. Let God be right and every man be a liar. Humble yourself before the Lord. And that's how you actually get lifted up. You don't get lifted up by your rightness. You don't get lifted up because you're right or you think you're right. Maybe you are right, but that's not how you get lifted up. You get lifted up when you lower yourself. God exalts you. That word right there, lift you up, in, in the Greek, it actually is the word exalt. But that word is so, like, there's a, a lot to that word exalt. The, he, the Greek is so much more descriptive. That word exalt, lift you up, is a metaphor in the Greek. Here's what it literally means. Check this out. It means to raise to the very summit of opulence and prosperity. Like God says, if you humble yourself, if you lower yourself, stop asserting your rightness and because you think you're right, you get to yell or argue. If you just lower yourself, I will raise you to the very summit of prosperity. Come on, does that sound like something good you want in your life? Amen, somebody? The more you go down, the more God lifts you up. The more you go down, the more God lifts you up. And then next, James brings up something that seems like out of left field in this section of James chapter 4. But you need to know that there is an unseen spiritual war happening in the middle of your fight. That what you're seeing and experiencing is not all there is. Satan is working to destroy, to divide, to steal. Um, the Bible says that we don't... We don't wage war the way the world, the world wages war. So James is talking about waging war here. And, and, and the apostle Paul tells us the weapons of our warfare are not the weapons. We gotta stop fighting like the world is fighting and, and start fighting the way God's called us to fight. So here's what you need to recognize. Number four, you need to recognize the source behind hurtful words. What is the source? Because you're not battling against flesh and blood. I did a whole week on this in 21 days of prayer. If you want to go back in our YouTube channel, I did a whole week on spiritual warfare. And here's something James just wants you to understand. Like in the middle of your fight, you're not fighting who you think you're fighting. Ephesians 4, 27 says, anger gives a mighty foothold to the devil. Listen, when you're, when you're angry, it gives the devil a place in your life. When you're operating out of, out of anger, the devil, you're opening the door to the devil access into your life. You're, here's how James says it in verse 7. He says, resist the devil and he will flee. That word resist is a military term. It says, take your stand against or to oppose. So he's saying, it's like, hey, you got to recognize. Stop standing against people and recognize the source. You want to know one way how to do it? How to disarm your enemy. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 says, Anyone you forgive, Paul says, I also forgive. In order that Satan might not outwit us. See, one way that you, that you can disarm the enemy and the demonic work that may be active in your life is letting that thing go, is forgiving that person. That longstanding hostility and argument and those disputes, you gotta let that stuff go because Satan will outwit you. He says, for we are not unaware of his schemes. I don't want you to be unaware of the enemy's schemes in your life because the enemy, he, he wants to outwit you. He wants to put you in a posture of reactionary and frustrated and stressed and angry so that, I mean, if you find yourself there, you're exactly where the enemy wants you and you will be out, outwitted. Can I show you something? I know this like this is a little biology lesson, but I want you to see this just so you can see where, wh how the enemy works. I don't want you to be outwitted by it. Did you know that your brain actually has three parts, that you were created not only triune and body, soul, spirit, but God created your, your brain like triune. 
You have three parts of your brain. I'll tell you where I'm going with this. I'll tell you where I'm going, but I just, I think you should know this. I think it'll apply. So there's three parts of your brain. There's the neocortex, which is like the rational thinking. That is the best version of you. That's when you're at your best and thinking at your best is when you're thinking with your neocortex. There is a second brain though called the limbic brain. And that is your emotional, illogical the feeling reactionary brain part of you. And then there's another part that is your basal ganglia. That's just the instinctual. You didn't have to really think about it. You just, it's a motor skill, okay? Here's what is happening. I just want you to see this. Here's what's happening. Every time that you are angry, you're afraid, you're stressed out, you literally move from your highest level of thinking into your limbic brain. When you are emotional, when you raise your voice, listen to me, when you raise your voice, servant of God, you are stupider. <laughs> you literally have become more dumb when, you are, when you're angry and raising your voice, you're stressed out and you're, you, when you got caught into that thing. Here, and here's why I'm telling it to you because I don't want the enemy to outwit you. That's where he wants you. Here's what the Bible says. We are transformed by what? The renewing of our minds, that God wants to change you into a brand new person by changing the way you think. Now, if the enemy can get to stop you thinking, to get you from thinking the way you should be thinking on what you should be thinking, if he can get you reactionary and emotional and stressed and afraid and, and fighting, he got you exactly where, you, where he wants you and you are gonna lose that fight. You're gonna lose it. If you stay there, so, so this is why I showed it to you, because every time that you get into this place, you, see, you feel f afraid or stressed or angry, you need to just know you're more dumber right there. <laughs> and you need to step outside of that and engage a higher level. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Pause, stop, cool down. And you know what you should do, verse eight. That's why he says the next verse, verse eight. He says, here's what you should do. Come close to God. Are oh, you angry? Are you stressed? Instead of reacting, instead of getting emotional, hey, come close to God. And here's the promise. God will come close to you. So here, you want to stop the fighting? Here's the principle. Number five, get God's perspective and his presence. I mean, what would that look like if in the middle of your fighting or your anger or your fear or your stress that you actually removed yourself for a moment, if not physically, just even in your mind that you just went to God. If you can't remove physically, in your mind you went to God and you started thinking about some verses. You started thinking about some scripture. You started saying, God, what do you want from me in this? God, what are you doing in this? And you just get God's perspective in it instead of being reactionary or defensive or, or sarcastic or try to prove your rightness. What if rightness, you just left that out for a moment and you just tried to get right with God. Because some of you, like you would rather be right than get it right. I don't know about you, but I'd rather, I'd rather get it right. I'd rather have God's presence and perspective in my life. So let me, let me finish this section up in the message paraphrase, James chapter four, verse seven through 10. I love how it says it in the message. It says, so what do we do then with this? How do we, what do we do? So let God work his will inside of you. Yell aloud no to the devil and watch him make himself scarce in your life. Say a quiet yes to God and he'll be there in no time. I love that. Some of you need that today. Some of you need to say a yes to God. Some of you need to start, quit doing this. Quit dabbling in sin, he says. Purify your inner life. How do you do that? Get down on your knees before the master. It's the only way you'll get on your feet. Can I pray that over you today? Because we need to do number six. Number six, we need to decide that we want to change and ask forgiveness. And I want to help you with that decision today. Some of you, it's like, some of you are tired of fighting. You're tired of the conflict. You're tired of the war waging inside of you. And what you need is the grace of God. Like you can't change yourself, but listen to me, God can. Can I pray that over you all over this place, online? Will you just bow your heads and pray with me right where you are? God, we need you today. What we cannot change ourselves, we submit and surrender. God, change our heart. I don't wanna be someone who fights and quarrels and who destroys and is destructive in my life. God, we wanna be your servant. 
God, forgive me for hiding my rightness in my arguments. I'm hiding behind being right and treating people wrong. God, forgive me right now. You know that's you. If that's you, God, forgive me. Help me to recognize the real enemy. Fight the real enemy. Today, I lay down my pride. I want your perspective. I want your presence. Today, I want to draw near to you. Come near to me with every head bowed and eye closed. If you're here today, and maybe you've never prayed something like that, maybe you've never surrendered your life to God and drawn near to him, can I just encourage you, like today is the day that you can, you don't need to fix yourself. In fact, you can't. Just like James is telling us, let God do his work in you. And if you're willing today, that can start. With every head bowed and eye closed, if you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, I'd love to give you an opportunity to do that. If you're watching online, you've never gave your life to Christ, or maybe you need to do it again, I would love to pray with you right here, right now. I'm not going to have you come up to the front or single you out, but just right where you are, if you're ready for a fresh start and for God to by his grace, begin to change your life, change your marriage, change your mind. That can happen. That can begin right now. Come on, if that's you, here's what I want to do. On the count of three, I just want you to lift your hand. Or if you're online, type in the words, I need Jesus. On the count of three, one, two, three, lift that hand up. I surrender. I need a fresh start. God, renew my mind, renew my heart all over this place. Yes, yes, yes. Leave it up for me. Yeah, yeah, yes, 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 yes. Amen, amen, amen. Yeah. Praise God, praise God. Yes, yes, are we here? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. All over this place. God, we thank you. We thank you, God. Hallelujah. Go ahead and put your hands down. Will you pray with me something like this? Just say, Jesus. Come on, whisper it. Forgive me of my sins. Today, I surrender the control of my life. I declare you're my Lord. Come live inside of me and make me brand new. Change me from the inside out. Help me to live for you from this day forward in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Come on, give God some praise if you receive that. Amen. Amen.